Um, so first, of all, I just must say uh, a big thanks and a big welcome to everybody for coming. As ever, um, without your attendance, these events just wouldn't happen. Um, I, I, you know, I have that figure that I'd always like to think that we could get 20 people, and if we get more than that, we're all right, and obviously, we're all right today. Um, obviously, we've got very special, special guests today. Uh, we haven't got a lot of time, so we need, need to crack on, but what I've done is I've asked um, uh, Dr. Penker, as head of the Department of Disability and Education, to, to give an introduction to our guests today. Thank you, David, and uh, hello to everybody. It's great to, to see so many students as well as uh, people from inside and outside of the university. Um, I won't share my anxiety dream that I had with you about doing this introduction, um, but I've already shared it with Ruth, so anybody can ask Ruth about that. It involved Rosemary Garland Thompson, uh, Mitchell Ann Snyder, um, and a number of other people. <laughs> uh, so. Um, welcome to Leonard J. Davis. So, uh, Leonard's Distinguished Professor of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Teachers in the English Department in the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, where he's also served as Head of Department to well over 40 people. Yeah? <laughs> so, a big job. In addition, he's a Professor of Disability and Human Development in the School of Applied Health Sciences of the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as Professor of Medical Education in the College of Medicine. Uh, his profile, therefore, is truly interdisciplinary, um, and the work fits, obviously, so well with, with the centre here. Um, I'm pleased to be able to welcome uh, Professor Davis to Liverpool Hope University for the second time. Um, so he came here in 2015 uh, to contribute to the seminar series there as well, which was the voice of disability. Uh, and that presentation was based on the stories we tell uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, based on material from his 2015 book, um, Enabling Acts, which you were saying has been made into an audio uh, version of that book. Um, so this first visit built on an established relationship already uh, with CCDS, so with the centre. Um, he was the first member of the board of JLCDS, uh, the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. Uh, for those new to hope, this journal is published uh, by the University of Liverpool, but based here with um, Associate Professor David Bolt is the editor-in-chief of that journal. Professor Davis is author of a number of books highly significant in the field of disability studies, uh, but these are also key courses, so think about our students that are here. Um, key course uh, texts for us that underpin undergraduate and postgraduate courses at HOPE, including Enforcing Normalcy, uh, Bending Over Backwards, Disability, Modernism, uh, and Other Difficult Positions, easy for you to say, Claire, um, and The End of Normal, Identity in a Biocultural Era. He's also series editor for the Routledge series Integrating Science and Culture and editor of the Disability Studies Reader, uh, which is now in its fifth edition. It's described as a gold standard text in disability studies uh, with chapters from leading writers in disability studies, including David, um, and it could certainly be described as a, a stellar collection. Leonard's work is truly interdisciplinary, bridging literary and cultural studies, history, medical humanities, disability studies, and more recently, biotechnology and the biosphere, which I won't pretend to be able to talk about here, but examining relationships between the human technologies and our shaping of the natural world. So we're really, really very pleased to welcome uh, Leonard. Um, he's travelled, I worked it, worked it out according to Google, uh, 3,779 miles to be with us today. Uh, so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce uh, Leonard Davis. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to David and Claire and anyone else involved. Uh, thank you for giving me this very typical uh, English weather, <laughs> which I look forward to so much. Um, <clears throat> so uh, David asked me to told me that you're working on emotion, and, I'm, and so I'm doing this talk. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be the world's expert on emotion, but I've tried to work it into the, a larger project that I'm working on about poverty and dis poverty, period, and disability, but, um, but about poverty particularly. So um, I, I call this talk uh, uh, Sorrowless Lamentation, and, and, this, and I happen to be reading this book called Michael Armstrong, Factory Boy, uh, which is written by Francis Trollope, who is, was Anthony Trollope's mother, and who wrote many more books than he wrote, but we don't really know that much about her. But anyway, this is about a factory boy in uh, uh, northern England. Um, and the quote that I really liked was, it says, and then the whole neighborhood rushed in to express their sympathy. This is about uh, a, a, a woman whose father died. 
till her very soul sickened under the cuckoo note of sorrowless lamentation. And I kind of like that because I think in a lot of the illustrations, I'm going to show you lots of pictures today, that the, the idea is that there, the relationship between disability and, uh, let, let's say, a disabled person and someone observing them who's not disabled often can fit into this idea of sorrowless lamentation, like you're sorry, but there's really no feeling behind it. Um, I guess p pity. By the way, the close-up on, on this illustration shows you that Michael, factory boy on the left, who's been adopted by a rich nobleman, and his brother, who's disabled on the right and poor, uh, is an interesting way to sort of think about and talk about what I want to show you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go kind of his oh, wait, hang on a second. I want to set a timer because I don't want to talk for more than 40 minutes. Um, so, uh, so one, I'm doing this historically, and basically I'm talking about uh, um, art and disability and poverty. But I'm going to focus on more on disability for today. So the first thing historically, and we know this from the, from the medical model, social model, charity model, is this idea that you start seeing images of disabled people in religious works, uh, religious art. So here's a painting called Seven Works of Mercy by Caravaggio. It's a very complicated picture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to describe these pictures, which is not gonna be easy. Um, but it's a very complicated picture with a lot of things happening in it. Um, each one of those things relate to one of the works of mercy in, uh, in, in, in Catholic uh, um, liturgy. So uh, the one I wanted to focus on, uh, so, in, so there's a lot of pictures. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison, you visited me. That's from Matthew uh, 25, 35, and 36. But those are, those are kind of like the works of mercy. Um, and you can see in the picture on the far right, there's a woman who's giving an old man her breast, uh, kind of like the end of um, uh, uh, Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath. But there's a, a, oh wait a minute, hang on. So actually this picture is in the wrong place, but that just starts me out by saying that you can see uh, images of disability and the, on, the, on the lower left, is a poor man who's also disabled. He's a naked figure with his back toward you, so you actually don't see his face. And the saint is giving him his cloak, uh, but also uh, it's in relationship to his poverty and his disability. So I, one of the questions I want to know is how do, we, how do we recognize disability in a visual work of art? So I have these four things I'm sure you could add to it. One, one is iconic, that is someone in the picture is pointing to a person with a disability or pointing to the ears or eyes or whatever is disabled. Um, uh, the other is, in, sorry, the iconic is more like you, you, you get a stereotypical view of what the disability is. The indexical is pointing to. The other is an activity that shows you the disability or that shows the lack of an ability. And the, the fourth thing is you see prosthetics. So you'd see like a crutch or something that would indicate that a person, or a, a cane for a blind man. Um, so then the other question I kind of want you to think about along with me is what are the aesthetic goals for showing uh, when you look at disability in art and what's the connected emotion? So first of all, and this is true for poverty as well, the genre often can be comic uh, and, and you know and so like uh, and, and the, the idea of comedy almost like Aristotle's idea of comedy is that it's about the lower classes not the, the rich or what, what tragedy is about. And then the, the emotion would be laughter or happiness. Then another thing that you might see in terms of representing disability is tragedy. Tra it's tragic. This is a terrible thing that's happened to somebody. And the emotions that would go with that are sadness, fear, or pity. Um, then there's, of course, as we know, the inspirational. Um, and what emotions are triggered in the inspirational. And believe me, you could add emotions here. There's supposed to be only six emotions. Some people add a seventh one. But I've, I've, made, I've nuanced that a little bit. So inspirational would be desire, joy, contentment. The other thing is a what, wisdom. So that like the disabled person sometimes is represented, particularly if they're with, with, with people who, you know, in, 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 in the past, with people who heard voices and so on, they were seen as wise. <coughs> that the disabled person can teach us something or there's something inherently wise about a particular kind of disability. I'll talk more about these as we look. But the, uh, so w w the wise can, ha the t can be two emotions. One could be interest, 
And the other could be shame because the wise person is telling you something you don't know and you're ashamed about it. The other, th then the other uh, concept is avoidance. So like that person is a, has a disability and you want to avoid them. So like for example, lepers. Uh, and what they would arouse is fear or disgust. And then there's the vicarious thing of like showing you a disability because you're vicariously interested in it. You know, so it, it's, it's partly what I would call like the travel mentality. Like let's go into the world of the poor, let's go into the world of the disabled, and the world of the blind, see what that's like. And the thing that's generally avoided in art at all costs is the actual care of oneself, sexuality, the boring details of daily life. And like people are not representing people with disabilities to show you the things that are really part of the lives of people with disabilities. Okay, so this was back to the Caravaggio painting. Here you can see the detail of the poor, lame man. He's supposed to be lame, and he's on the ground so that his positioning is, shows you that he's lame, and he's receiving the cloak from the saint. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you a representation of some religious imagery. This one is called Christ Healing a Deaf Man from 1579. It's Leonard Gautier is the artist. And it's a, uh, it's a kind of a pen and ink drawing. Uh, and it shows you that Christ is healing. It on the left, you see Christ with his hands on the ears of a, a man bent on his knees. And then there are people on the right who are pointing and observing this. So how do you know it's a deaf man? Because it's this indexical thing, right? Or it's the action that he's, he's covering his ears. By the way, if you go to the Bible, <coughs> you don't often hear me talk about, say that. But if you go to the Bible, um, then you read the thing about Christ. Have you read the, th the, the, the parable of Christ curing the deaf man? It's kind of weird, right? Do uh, you want to say what it is? No. <laughs> um, he, he spits in man's mouth because he's mute, right? So he, he, gets, he spits in his mouth and then he uh, covers his ears. So it, even that is kind of a strange um, activity. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, here's Christ curing a leper, another pen and ink. Uh, and and uh, the way that we know the leper is, a le is Christ sta standing with his gesturing toward the leper, who we know is a leper because there are spots on his body. Um, and his cloak is, he's being held, a man behind him is kind of un, either covering him up so that we don't see the um, uh, leprosy or pulling it away so that we do see it. And, you, and, and looking at these things, we want to kind of understand, well, what's the emotional content of this? I mean, there is, uh, clearly we're supposed to see kind of disgust for the leper. You know, very few people like love leprosy, um, although I guess we should all learn, learn to do that. But, um, but Christ is obviously, his uh, figure is, and there's radiation kind of coming out from his head, uh, his figure is obviously dignified, he's not disgusted, although there's no contact. Um, in fact, no one's touching the, the leprous man. Um, but so, in the, here's another religious one. This is uh, Ducho de bon, Boninsegna, healing the man born blind. It's a temper on, on oil on wood and from 1308. And it shows a group of saints or people behind Christ, uh, disciples, and Christ is bending over and touching the eyes of the blind man. We know he's blind because he has a cane or a staff and, and because Christ is indexically touching the eye. If you think about it, it's kind of hard to represent certain disabilities visually, right? How do you go about doing that? And then this is part of that, um, the uh, kind of internal logic of painting is at this age where you show the man in his, afterwards, he can see. He's right next to the other man. It's not two men. It's the same man. Now he can see, and the way that we, we, we know he can see, how has the artist represented that? He's put the staff down, and he's looking up into the sky, presumably not only seeing the sky, but also divinity. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, so again, the, in this religious kind of connotation, it's about, you know, the, the divinity of Christ, about an interesting if you think about it, is that Christ kind of got his credentials. Like, how did you know that Christ was Christ if you were back then and not just somebody? Because he could cure disabilities. I mean, that, that's his calling card. You know, he doesn't part the Red Sea. He doesn't, you know, make buildings fall down. He can't fly. But what he does is the way he goes, that people know that he's uh, divinely inspired or whatever, is that he cures disabilities. And that's kind of an interesting thing. So 
pointed, I mean, in the religious concept, one of the other concepts is that disability clearly is a bad thing because you need Christ to get rid of it. Um, and it, it, no, no, no one's out there going like, hey, I'm, I'm disabled and I'm proud because the message is that Christ can fix you if you're broken or if you're, you know. And that goes back to the issue about how did you get disabled? Is it sin? By the way, I, was just, I just gave a talk at the, a theological seminary, and I asked the people there a question was, are there disabled people in heaven? Um, <clears throat> depends on what your vision of heaven is, but it, it, are, people, uh, are people perfect in heaven? Are their bodies perfect? Or if you were deaf in, um, in the earth, would you still, would you use sign language in heaven or not? Interesting theological debate depending on how you see disability. Is disability like a mistake, or is disability a quality? And clearly, all this, for all these religious paintings, uh, it's, the disability is not a good thing. Here's El Greco, Christ healing the blind. I have a theme here today for, <laughs> for no apparent reason. Uh, and this is circa uh, 1570. And again, how do you know the man is blind? Uh, so there's a picture, neoclassical setting with classical buildings. Uh, there's a group on the right who are, um, who are kind of observing and turning away from the uh, group on the left, which has Christ, the, the man who's supposed to be blind, and another man. And then there's a group, a, a, a group in the foreground kind of cut off at the bottom, a woman and a man. And the man also um, appears to be darker skinned than some of the other characters. And so it's, you, know, you can make your own interpretation on this and what it means. But you can see that one of the elements of the religious painting is awe and wonder. And this is something that El Greco captures. The people on the right are kind of staring at this miracle going on. The blind man, as in many cases of the deaf one too, is on his knees. So it's like kind of lesser in the, in the arrangement. But Christ is touching his uh, eye, hand to the man's eye and holding the man's hand. <clears throat> and we also get the image of vision because the, the, the person right to the left of the blind man is pointing up at something in the sky. So it indicates that he can see and that the blind man will maybe look up like the other blind man. Where these, so, so again, you get the sense, what's the emotion here? It's kind of like awe, dignity. The face of Jesus is very kind of benign and uh, uh, caring. And the blind man has no expression. Um, here's a Raphael painting, The Healing of the Lame Man, and uh, this is a drawing that was supposed to be for tapestry that was never made. Um, so again here, uh, this is an interesting composition because th there are two columns that are kind of wavy columns that separate the figures on the left, the figures on the right, and the figures in the middle. Of course, in the middle is Christ. Uh, and. Um, the lame man not only is lame, because you can see his, his legs are kind of twisted and the musculature is kind of interesting, but he's also ugly. Um, so there's an interesting kind of visuality that's associated with disability. He's, not, he's kind of a, got a grotesque face, uh, whereas the, uh, others in the picture, like Christ and some of the people around him, have more kind of classical faces. So there's, again, the image of the dignity of Christ, vertical, you know, very dignified, and then the lame man all twisted up on the bottom, but we know he's going to be cured, and that would be a good thing. Um, okay, now leaving the religious stuff aside, I mean, obviously there's the famous uh, blind uh, man of classical literature, Homer, uh, and here's a Pier Francesco Mola painting called Blind Homer uh, from approximately 1640. Um, it's just a circle, uh, it's a kind of a, an oval painting, with just the face, it's obviously a detail from uh, uh, maybe a, an architectural detail from so something. Uh, and home and the, is an old old man with a gray beard, white beard. Uh, he's got the laurel wreath on his head and he has long hair, but his eyes are closed. So that's how we know it's Homer. So I mean, the one way to indicate blindness is either someone pointing to the eyes or just the eyes being closed, which we know, of course, they're not fully closed. One eye is slightly open. Um, Okay, so here's uh, Peter Bruegel, the Elder, and this is the earliest painting that I can find that doesn't have a religious significance. Uh, of, uh, 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 and it shows, it's called The Cripples or the Beggars, which I think is important, 1568. And it shows th four men uh, who are, have um, sticks in their hand, crutches, I guess. Uh, and, but they're also... Uh, uh, kind of short and bent over in some cases, and there's a figure 
in the, whose face is not toward us, and it's not, I, I don't know whether he's one of the men or not. And then there's a figure on the right who's standing clothed, but is holding a bowl. <clears throat> so this is a complicated thing, because they're called either the cripples or the beggars. Generally, when you want to represent someone being a beggar, they're holding a bowl. Uh, so that woman in the back, or if it's a man, uh, is holding a bowl. And, and you don't know whether the figures in the foreground, who are all kind of askew and, and, and uh, um, not in any kind of dignified or, um, uh, um, yeah, not in any dignified stature or posture. So it's important to understand that in this era, uh, there was a crossover between disability and poverty. I mean, it's true for every era, but particularly with beggars, often beggars were, were, uh, were um, disabled. It's a way that they can, uh, could get money by showing that they couldn't, can't work or that they were somehow um, literally disabled. But I, I think the question on this picture is, is it a funny picture? Are we supposed to think of it as funny? I mean, if you look at it in the context of kind of neoclassical cynicism at the time, or you know, way that people painted, there's something obviously supposed to be grotesque about this. And I don't know whether the emotion that we're supposed to regard this with is humor. Uh, do we are we supposed to laugh at these ca uh, at these figures? I don't think this is a painting that. Um, I mean, I think you could say with Bruegel in general, it, you know, a lot of the stuff is funny or amusing, but I think it fits into the category of the grotesque. Um, so this is more Bruegel. This is a painting called The Blind Leading the Blind, and it's from 1568. Um, some people say that this is like a very like accurate medical examination of blindness in the era because each person has a different kind of blindness. So we're no longer talking about someone pointing at the eyes of a blind man. If you look carefully, there's different features of the blindness. But the point about the picture is that the blind are leading the blind. And, they're f and the lead blind man is falling over another person. So the point is, is, so there's something comic about the picture. It's like if the blind lead the blind, that's not going to be a good thing. Um, again, no dignity. And, and one, of the, one of the things you want to think about in terms of looking at art is like, who's doing it? I mean, if, is a disabled person painting a disabled person? Or is it someone who's not disabled and doesn't think of themselves as disabled portraying the, the, uh, the people with disabilities? Um, here is a little detail from a, a very interesting painting by Bruegel called Netherlandish Proverbs. And if you're really clever and you look at this picture in detail, there's something like a hundred proverbs that are in the painting. But obviously in the distance is the blind leading the blind again. Um, the one, there's one, <laughs> uh, where is it? There's, a, there's somebody in here, hit, a man hitting his head against the wall, which is like, we have that same expression. but. Um, Anyway, this is obviously a comic picture. Is the man hitting his head against the wall? Like head, it's like hitting your head against the brick wall. Um, okay, so then I'm just I have a bunch of uh, pictures by Callot, 1622, from a from a book called Les Gu. Uh, but the thing that's interesting about it is that it's all pictures of poor people who are also disabled. So the cover shows us in in the kind of pen and ink or etching. A poor man, and how, how, how do you, the other interesting question is how do you represent poverty in, in a painting? And there's really basically two ways that you represent it, since everybody has a body, right? Um, one is rags, raggedness. And I, by the way, I'm wearing a jacket today. I don't know if you can see it, that's ragged. It's designed to be ragged, but um, uh, I just did that so you'd feel at home. But uh, <laughs> so, but here's the but the other thing that is a, about uh, how you can tell someone's poor is often they have a, their hand out. Um, that's an iconic way you can show it. By the way, uh, I discovered this that um, primates do the same thing. So you know, monkeys will indicate th that they want something by going like that. So it's a very deep uh, wired into us that gesture. Um, so here from, that, from this series is a woman, a beggar woman with crutches, and you see a woman who's ragged also, if you look at the edges of her clothing, with two crutches bent over. Here is a tattered beggar, obviously by definition tattered, with, but look at his legs. He's also got crutches. So the, in other words, we tend to want to separate out disability from poverty, but really, the, it, you know, it, it's very connected, um, even iconically in this way. Here's another beggar with crutches. This man has a, two crutches, he has a, a wooden leg, and he's also in tatters, all from Kello. 
And you also want to ask yourself, like, why were people buying this book? Or, you know, like, be, uh, th what's the interest in showing poor people and disabled poor people? Is it, you know, what are the emotions that are involved in that? Is it like there but for the grace of God go I? Is there something like, well, this is an interesting aspect of human diversity? Uh, it, it, you know, because these, and they're often painted or drawn in a way that's really clearly says this is not you, the observer. Um, here's a woman with a cane bent over, like hello also. And then here's an interesting thing. Um, I have side by side the Callow beggar of 1622, which we were, with, you see the hand extended, and he's got the ragged clothing. Next to it is a picture of Rembrandt's self-portrait, uh, which he did as, when he was a young man. And it shows Rembrandt sitting on like a, a, a I don't know what, some kind of undistinguishable, low, very low thing, where he's basically on the ground. He's got sandals on, his clothing is ragged, and he is in the position of being a beggar. Some people speculate that Rembrandt at that point wasn't famous. He was dependent, like many artists were, on the handouts that he got from rich people. So he actually saw himself in the same category as the tattered beggar. Um, here's just in the, no disability in this one, but you see the hand extended. It's a gr family grouping, also uh, pen and ink, showing a, a man, a woman, and a, presumably a child at the door of a very wealthy man who's quite nicely dressed. And the woman does have a stick, though. So it makes you think, does she, is, that, is that a disability sign, or is that just the sign of being like a pilgrim? She has a baby on her back, and she's got her hand extended, and into their hand, the man is dropping a coin. <clears throat> Which is kind of the nexus between, I mean, the, if the viewer is someone who's better off than the poor people, it's sort of the relationship is similar to the man who's giving the money, right? Um, OK, this is a, a, a painting by Ribera. Uh, called The Boy with the Club Foot, and it's from 1642. And he has a piece of paper in his hand. I'll, I'll describe the picture. But he has a piece of paper in his hand in Latin that says, give me alms for the love of God, indicating that he's mute as well, because otherwise, why would he have uh, the picture, the, 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 the sign? It's like the deaf people who give out those cards. you know. And he's looking very happy. Uh, he does have ragged clothing, a little bit ragged. Uh, but he has, uh, he's carrying a stick on his arm like a, like a crutch. You can see his foot, there's a kind of a realistic anatomical detail of the club foot. And one of the things you want to sort of wonder about this is, what are we supposed to think about this? You know, um, are, are we supposed to just sort of, the noticeable thing is how happy the boy is. You know, he is demonstrating to us that having a disability is no big deal and that it doesn't affect your mood or your temperament, and, and it's just nice. He's out in beautiful nature. I don't know what he's holding. Anybody have a sense of what that is? A bag? Um, and, uh, you know, so this is a series of Spanish paintings that I'm going to show you that show people with disabilities in interesting emotional states. So Velasquez did a series of uh, paintings of um, uh, people at court, the, 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 the court liked ha to have jesters, or buffoons as they call them, and um, not, many of them were people of short stature. So Velasco says his painting of, of Sebastian de Mora Diego from 1645. We see him dressed very royally, very elegantly. His two feet, you know, are foreshortened and facing us. His hands are kind of in a fist on his lap, and he is looking directly at us. This is an interesting thing because in art, some, Michael Fried, as an art historian, has talked about the, the difference between absorption and theatricality. And the idea is that if people in the painting are absorbed in what they're doing, that's one kind of thing. Theatrical is that they're looking out at you. They're doing something, they're being theatrical. And so in this case, he's looking directly face to face with you. And he doesn't look, he's not happy, he's not smiling like the, the beggar boy. He looks serious. And you, you know, you might even say slightly hostile, uh, or at least intent, intense. So what is Velasquez telling us? Because he's supposed to be a court jester. So is it, you know, is it like, well, there's another side to being a jester? Or is it like there's a dignity? Because there's a dignity in this painting that um, we haven't seen in other ones. And there's a series of paintings by Velasquez uh, of the je court jesters. This man is Don Diego de Acedo. He's wearing a kind of very Renaissance costume, black, big, kind of dramatic, black hat, uh, black clo velvet clothing. He has a huge book. He was also the scribe. In addition to being the jester, he was the scribe at court. 
Um, he's looking out, but down, kind of, pensively. Uh, these are not exactly the kind of paintings that you would assume of court jesters, right? I mean, you would, you would imagine someone wearing fool's motley and, you know. Um, here's uh, another court buffoon, uh, Calabas Calabasias Diego. This one's a little bit, he's smiling. There's something a little bit more uh, playful about this. Still dressed in rather elegant clothing. Um, so you kind of want to ask yourself, what do these add up to? I mean, partly, what emotions are associated with this? I mean, on a certain level, if you were, you know, if you had never seen people with short stature, or you didn't, you weren't, you weren't a member of court, you might say there's a kind of element of wonder, of you know, because also, I don't know if you if you you know this, but the word monster comes from the Latin mostrare, which means to show. So the idea is that like a monster is a fluke of nature, sport of nature that shows you that God is at work in the world. It's a, uh, see, if God's at work, then he can do unusual things. So in a way, uh, are we supposed to look at these paintings and think, well, this is a, a kind of various interesting monstrosities of a certain kind in the sense of showing something. Here's a one, this is another portrait of a dwarf, as it's called, 1426, by Juan van der Hamen y Lyon, who was, a, uh, who was a, a Dutch painter, actually, who came to also paint in the court of, that Velasquez was in. And here's an elegantly dressed man, uh, beautiful clothing, green, with, uh, with a little, you know, can you see there are little red tears in it? That was a fashion in the Renaissance to have torn clothing. So you get the kind of sense of the, the tatters but it's the rich people who are now using the tatters. Uh, and he has a beautiful Van Dyke beard, and he's very well appointed, looking not at you, but a, askance. Um, here's a painting, I mean, here's another person of small, small stature with a dog, uh, very, same thing. So there's a series by Velasquez that does this. But here's another one that's interesting with the same court, uh, Juan Carina de Miranda's painting of Eugenia Martinez Vallejo, who was also known as the giant girl. Uh, this is 1680. Um, she is in the same court. You know, in other words, the court, when there were, when there were people with disabilities of various kinds that were interesting, they, they were brought to court. She's six years old, by the way. And she, you know, according to the era, I mean, she is, she is a, a, so these are two paintings, one of her clothed and one of her naked. And she is the clothed one wearing very elegant clothing that almost emphasizes how, uh, how much weight she has on her because the clothing itself is built to expand out. But this is a kind of obesity that, you know, for us would be actually kind of normal now, especially in the US. Uh, but she was considered so uh, abnormal or unusual she was brought to court. There's no other painting at this point that shows a, a woman clothed and naked. I mean, she's a girl. But th this is an interesting kind of contrast, almost like an experiment. They say, like, look at this monstrosity, but we, look what we can do when we dress her up, when we take her clothes off. There's a fig leaf not, uh, carefully placed on her uh, body uh, in the naked one. Um, by the way, uh, you may know the painting, the, 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 the naked Maha, that was painted after this. Some people think that this, these two paintings may have influenced it because there's one of her painted clothed and one of her naked. Um, <clears throat> okay, a portrait of, of a, a dwarf. Obviously, people of small stature brought to court were of interest to painters. This one, she's in a natural setting. She's wearing almost like peasant clothing, and she's got a dog at her foot, no, and a sheep. Um, and there's a beautiful, you know, kind of village and castle in the background. I mean, these are not meant, these are meant to be unusual, but not, one thing about all these paintings, which is unlike the Bruegel painting, is that they are, they're, they're dignified paintings of people who are real people. And this feels like someone who's real, worthy of being painted. I mean, not everyone has, is painted. So you have to be uh, you know, either nobility or a, to be a real person. You can paint and you can just paint, invent scenes and pose people. But to paint real people, to do portraits, there has to be something about them that's important. Um, here's a not, this is not a real person, but it's called, it's by Murillo, it's called The Lice Ridden Boy, or The Young Beggar, and it shows a boy sitting in, in an indoor setting that has, is barren, uh, he's just eaten a little, a few shrimp that are on the ground, and he is picking lice from his chest, and they believe it or not, in art history, because I look this up, there's a whole history of lice picking in art, I mean, that's, you know, academics are good at finding niche categories, um, 
But lice picking, obviously, it's not, it, it, it does indicate something of, about disease. Even though lice, pick, lice were, was much more common in the past and hard to get rid of even now, he said, scratching his head. Um, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, this is also interesting to me because of the crossover between disability, poverty, disease. You know, they, we want to kind of separate those categories out, but I think it's in a way more interesting to bring them together. Okay, so then here's two uh, paintings, uh, portraits. These are actually portraits of people who were literary, uh, uh, you know, characters. One is Sir Joshua Reynolds' portrait of Giuseppe Baretti on the left. Shows him reading a book, but as you can see, he's holding the book extremely close to his face. This, by the way, I chose this picture on the cover of my first book, which was about the history of the origins of the English novel and nothing to do with disability. But I found it an interesting picture because uh, Clearly, he was super nearsighted, as am I. If I take my contact lenses out, that's how I read books. But, uh, you know, but it's just, he did it to sort of say, like, this is who the guy is. And because he was a writer, a literary critic, the idea of bringing the book really close to his face shows that it's really part of who he is. So this, and with famous people like this man on the left, the he, who, who, uh, portrait of James Hutton, 1786, he has a horn on his ear, clearly indicating that he um, you know, can't hear that well, and this is a listening device. But it's just shown to be part of who he is. Probably, if you knew him, he was carrying that around all the time. It's not anything. It doesn't fit into the category of the monstrous, or uh, or even of um, like, well, this is a severe disability worth noticing. It's actually just part of his personality. And so I, I think our response is just to go ho hum. Yeah, that's that's who this guy is. Um, so. You may have heard of Alexander Pope. I'm, I'm an English professor, so I would demand that you know who he is. But uh, he wrote The Rape of the Law, 18th century author. He was well known for ha having a certain spinal deformity. And what's interesting, and this is two paintings by the same author within two years of each other. One shows him on the left. You would have no idea that he has a spinal deformity and, uh, or spinal curvature. Uh, he's, wearing, he's very noble looking. He's wearing a, a wig. Uh, as they did in the 18th century. But the one on the right shows him without the wig, although he has a, 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 some kind of a crown, like, like Homer did, you know, laurel crown on him. But you can clearly see that he has the spinal curvature. And it's interesting that the same painter would paint him in two different ways. Uh, I, I, I wonder whether this is a statement about the fact like, well, you can think about Pope two different ways. You can think about him as this, you know, kind of figure you would see in a museum or really famous you know, person, or would you see him the way maybe you might see him if he was more casual, wearing his like at-home clothing, and you know his skin is a little bit more rough and ready there. You know, uh, he looks a little more ill perhaps because he did die shortly thereafter. Um, so maybe is this a way of saying like disability is built in, like with the other characters, but this way maybe two views of it. It's a famous uh, a, a person, Matthew Buchinger in the 1700s. Uh, this is a painting, picture by Elias Beck. You may know about him because there was a big show in the Metropolitan Museum of Art a couple years ago that was organized. And this is from the book that was put together by the magician Ricky Jay. You know, you know Ricky Jay? But he was fascinated by this guy who was uh, 28 inches tall. Um, he's shown wearing like very noble clothing. But he also was a very good, he could do a million different things. So. Around outside of the picture are all of the many things he can do. Uh, he was a magician uh, himself. He could also, and if you have a chance to look at this guy's work, he's amazing. He can he could do micro writing, like he can condense you know like 500 words into something this big, which he wrote by hand. So so obviously this is a kind of wonder, you know, like a cabinet of curiosities kind of picture, but it's a celebration of this man you know, who, who could do these amazing things. All right, so then we kind of move into uh, I'm gonna, the 19th century and pictures of poor people and poor disabled people. So this is an interior, it's called Pictorial History of Manchester by George Catt, 1844. And just the interior of a Manchester house, obviously uh, poor people, you can see the table is askew. Poverty became a real, so, so Poverty was of interest in the past in the way that I showed you because it was kind of like funny or grotesque. In the 19th century, and it's no, ex it's no coincidence, you begin to have a working class movement, you begin to have the Chartists, you begin to have Engels writing about the working class, 
you begin to have strikes and unionization, and suddenly the image of the poor changes uh, fairly dramatically. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to speed up here. Uh, so here's a picture by John Everett Millay called The Blind Man, 1853, and on his neck it says, pity the blind, he's being led by a woman across the street and to chaos, the street is in chaos, horses are backing off because the blind man can't, this is kind of a, supposed to be a funny thing, the blind man can't see, the woman isn't really helping him, and you also have that image of a poor boy begging from the blind man, but the blind man can't see him, uh, even though the dog has just got something in his mouth, stolen something. Um, the same guy, John Everett Millay, has a painting called The Blind Girl, 1856, and it's a, you can see that she's got a, an accordion on her lap, her clothes are a little tattered, she's a beggar, and she's got a daughter who's staring at the rainbow while the blind woman has her eyes closed so she can't see it. So it's a kind of complicated story about being blind, being poor, but also lacking something and not being able to see what her daughter can see. Um, lots of pic paintings of rag pickers, uh, you know, uh, who, again, you begin to see a crossover between disability and poverty. Um, here's another rag picker. I'm gonna go through these. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go a little fast. Okay, here, here's a, a painting called Worn Out, 1868 by Thomas Fade. And it shows a man kind of like you know, in an attic, uh, like a garret with his daughter in bed, uh, covered by a coat. And he's just like on a chair, stretched out, looking totally exhausted. And this is the beginning of a kind of critique of labor, of the way that he's not disabled, but he will be because so many factory workers and so many laborers in the 19th century became disabled through the work that they did. But it's just a kind of statement. What is our reaction supposed to be? Outrage, you know, there's something wrong with this. Why do people have to live like this? I mean, the paintings begin to change. They have a social, political message. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one. Well, actually, the reason I just have these in is the, this is the opposite. This is paintings by Ford Maddox Brown showing working people looking really healthy. You know, so you have like the, some painters are t saying like we're really abusing the working class and other painters are saying like, hey, this is the salt of the earth. So these men are working on the street. You can see the rich people around them wearing, you know, they, these men are like, they have their, ch their, their ch chest bare a little bit. They look really good. Um, well. And then here's the other equivalent. This is the dinner hour at Wigan, 1874, by Air Crow, that shows like working class girls coming out of the factory. There's the, the buildings in the background are all that red brick that you guys know so well up here in the north, or in the middle Midlands. Um, these are the factory towns. Not a tree in sight, not a blade of grass. But the girls are all relaxed. They're loose. They're lying back. They're talking. They're they you know they have nice clothes on. No one's ragged. Uh, so it's like two views of the working class, you know, one, and here's another one of the factory girls at the old clothes fair, you know, they're buying old clothes, but they're all having a ball, it looks great, you want to go there and, you know, go, it's like a flea market, you know, so being a factory worker is good because you get the money to buy all this clothing, so there's like two views that are being articulated by the upper class, one is we got a problem, and the other one is, now nah, we don't have a problem. Um, I'm going to skip these. Um, okay, I want to go to, I have a million pictures, I'm sorry. Uh, so I want to go to this just to bring up the issue about prostitution. Because the one issue that we often don't think of necessarily is connected with disability is prostitution. So this is a painting by Pascal Adolphe Jean Daniel Bouveret called Arrest by the Seine. And to, you know, it's a picture of a, a woman who's a laundress who's sitting on the a bench on the Seine and two men are walking by arm in arm looking at her askance. In, in according to the iconology, uh, iconography of, um, of the era, the people who, the women who were prostitutes were washerwomen. Um, they're fla women who sold flowers. So this painting, Edward Cleague Wilkinson's Spring Piccadilly, shows a young, a couple of, a, a young woman with uh, her family, and she's offering a flower to a rich woman who has a little child who's holding a hoop. But the thing is, for you, for us now, we look at it, oh, isn't that nice, she's offering a flower. But the, in that era, you know, women who sold flowers were, uh, uh, that was a sign that you were a prostitute. So just think about if you watch, if you like the opera La Boheme, you know, Mimi is a, uh, she, she 
is interested in flowers, and she's also a seamstress, which was the other profession that uh, prostitutions, prostitutes often moved back and forth between. So here's three paintings. I'm not going to tell you anything about them other than that they show women selling flowers, and they all look very seductive. And uh, So this is like a link to the image of is factory work good or bad? Is something like, is prostitution good or bad? So in these pictures show us like, hey, prostitution's kind of nice, like the women are pretty. Um, here's a painting by Jean Barreau called La Tante. It's a part of a series, so if you saw all the paintings, you would see the man in the distance and the woman in the foreground come together and make an arrangement. Uh, she's, you know, so it's another prostitution thing. Again, a very kind of romantic view of it in some ways. All right, I'm over my time. Um, here's, here's another kind of given the Harvey Weinstein era that we're in now. Um, <laughs> another profession for prostitutes were ballet dancer. Here's kind of like the Harvey Weinstein guy and the young ballet dancer. It's not unclear what his motives are um, behind the scenes is called. Uh, but so I want to contrast that to this painting by Toulouse-Lautrec, which shows two prostitutes. It's called the medical inspection. And it shows two women who are prostitutes. Again, they're not that cute, you know, sort of like flower-like girls. They're real women who are holding their skirts up and are about to, so there was a law in France that prostitutes had to be examined every month by a, a, a doctor. So they're waiting in line to, be having, having, to have a vaginal examination. So like, there's no romanticism here. This is a job, you could have a disease as a result of, that's what they're being inspected for. And the disease can lead to other kinds of disabilities. And I just show you another photograph of Elizabeth Fallon, 38-year-old woodchopper and prostitute from England. You know, again, we, we, there was the reality, and then there's the uh, the um, you know the fantasy. And this is a painting by Degas did a, a series of uh, monotypes where he was in. He, he spent a lot of time in houses of prostitution, and you see a very different set of images for what that work was like. But it's important to remember that that was work that was an option for women because of the very bad working conditions they had that also led to disease and to disability. I'm going to skip that. Um, just a, a painting real quickly of uh, called The Strike. Um, it shows by Robert Kohler, 1886. It shows a, a, you know, a typical North England a mining town, or maybe it's not North England, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a British uh, painting. And you've got the rich man at his house. You see the, the, the poor conditions and the mill town behind. And the factory workers are angry, and and uh, th and it, uh, it's a scene where violence is about to happen. A man in the foreground is bending down to pick a rock up. He's going to throw it. The woman is trying to prevent her husband or her boyfriend from doing something violent in the foreground. But it just shows us that these paintings of poor people don't have to be. It depends on what your political s viewpoint is. Either they're poor and they're worn out, or they're about to be uh, politically. Uh, active as this painting about the strike uh, at Le Creuset shows a group of people marching and demanding their rights. I'm going to I'm going to go through uh, the rest of these because I ran out of time, but I get, just want to get to this point. So uh, the next stage is that you begin to have paintings about sort of mental illness uh, that coincide with a, you know, a kind of art movement that was some, the Germans, the Nazis called degenerate art. Otto Dix is an important painter. This is a kind of black and white picture, hard to describe, uh, of um, like a broken tree and uh, you know uh, houses that are deformed. And in, in the foreground is this face of a smiling man uh, or child that's all blackened. And it's called a madman encounter with a madman at night. Um, then uh, this is I want to I don't know if you know about Elfrida Lowe's Wackler. She was a painter who painted during this period, did a lot of self-portraits. She was, had mental Ill, illness problems, and she was committed to a mental hospital where she did a lot of his painting. Now this is a change. Instead of having somebody painting from the outside, you're, now you're having people themselves with disabilities starting to do their own paintings of themselves, which changes suddenly everything feels kind of different. It doesn't feel like this kind of like they have to stand for something. It's more paintings of self-expression. She was killed uh, in the T4 program, by the way, by the Nazis. Uh, they went through all the asylums in Germany and they killed everybody who they thought was unworthy of living. So, um, all right, I'm gonna skip all that. But, so the question then is, here's a, a photograph by Diane Arbus. 
And I want you to think about what's the emotion that's supposed to be portrayed. Diane Arbus did photographs of people and institutions and people with disabilities of various kinds. And her paintings, you could say on the one hand, are very photojournalist, you know, that she's not making a comment, but th there is a comment, I think, of grotesquerie that you see in Diane Arbus' pictures. There's something scary. This is kind of from the outside, right? Uh, here's another Diane Arbus, Mexican dwarf in his hotel in New York. Um, and I want to compare that, I'm going to end by comparing it to a painting by Riva Valera uh, of Alice Shepard that was done, she did these series of paintings called Risk Paintings. I don't know if you know her work, she's a disabled artist. And a very different picture comes out in these Risk pictures, the person who is being painted is also asked to add to the painting. So you can see Riva Valera's figure in the foreground and the curtains, and some of the scrolls and stuff that are on the painting were done by Alice Shepard, who you may know was a, is a disabled uh, artist, a dancer who does, uh, who has a various disabled dancing troops, and she's part of. And you can see that when there's this image of a wheel uh, in the picture, because she's a wheelchair user and uses the wheelchair in in her dance uh, dancing. So this is like another. So like the question is also not only what emotion is aroused, but who's doing the painting. I think turns out to be really important. And I'm just going to end with showing you that I was involved in this uh, um, project. So Reba did this portrait of me, and my parents were deaf, so I, I scrolled in all this stuff about deaf and hearing and noise. But you know, it was a different situation now because I'm someone who doesn't have a, a disability, who's being painted by an artist who does have a disability, and we're working together. It's a very different concept of what art is.